Sports fans in hell, pretty much everybody has a hard time letting go of historical names for places or people or even things. No one calls this meta, not even Facebook. This isn't the Willis Tower, it's the Sears Tower. When the person formerly known as is part of your new name, have you really rebranded? The same can be said for Comiskey Park, the old stadium of the Chicago White Sox. The city still has a soft spot for the old stadium as they still have the original location of home plate permanently honored in what is now a parking lot. Took fans a while to become converters to the new stadium name of U.S. Cellular, and just when they had gotten used to it, they moved on to guaranteed right field in this super uplifting logo. So I get it. When those are your alternative names, and when you're probably also weighing in your memories of the old park, I get not wanting to leave Comiskey behind. That said, I don't think many people were wistful over the namesake of the old stadium. It was said that there were two camps of players on the Chicago White Sox in 1919 that barely spoke to one another, but they could all agree on one thing. Charles Comiskey pinched his pennies like he was trying to goose them to death. This conflict bubbled over into a World Series loss, eight men getting banned from the game for life, the dissolvement of the National Baseball Commission, and thus the appointment of baseball's first commissioner, and a famous crime boss getting his hands into the business of baseball. Today, we're talking about the next entrant into season two of the Experimental Baseball Tournaments. The theme of the season is second chances, and we're giving the players that have become to be known as the Black Sox a chance at redemption. Welcome back to the Dubs. Everything we do here is an excuse to tell a lot of baseball stories and a lot of jokes, so if that sounds interesting to you, stay in the know and help us grow with a shiny free of charge subscription to the channel. Back to the Black Sox. Think free agency is broken? Think service time loopholes come out of a bull's behind? They've got nothing on reserve clauses, which were part of baseball until 1975. Very early on, baseball players were making nothing, but by the late 19th century, baseball had swelled in popularity and players started earning salaries that were richer than the average American laborer. If teams were allowed to freely offer contracts for the best players around the league, owners realized this presented a high potential for bidding wars. Well, we couldn't have that. So enter the reserve clause. Players had a contract with a team, but the team also had rights to a player, meaning ownership had 100% say over where you would be playing in the future. The only way players made it to other teams was when a team traded the rights of one player for another player, the player's rights were released, which if you were a good player, that was unlikely to happen, or ownership decided to sell them outright for cash. This was bad news for the Chicago White Sox players when the person in charge of your team was the embodiment of Scrooge McNuck. Comiskey's highlights are promising the 1919 players a bonus if they won the pennant, which turned out to be a flat bottle of champagne. And screwing Eddie Chicotti out of the actual bonus he would receive for racking up 30 wins by benching him when he got close and making the players launder their own uniforms. Interesting side note with that last one. Some believe the Black Sox nickname existed prior to the scandal and was actually a reference to the lack of enthusiasm with which the players washed their own clothes. The 1919 White Sox had quite a few stud players on their team and were absolutely crushing it that year. Unsurprisingly, that led to several of the better players feeling like they were underpaid. So some of the players decided to take money making into their own hands. The suggestion to fix the series was initially put out there by Joseph Sullivan, a bookkeeper and gambler. He didn't have the necessary money to sway enough players to affect the outcome of the series, however. Enter Arnold Rothstein. If you're a Boardwalk Empire fan, it was this guy. Dude may have had a gambling problem. The guy that shot and killed him certainly seemed to think so. It was said that he played in a high stakes poker game for three days and amassed a debt that's the equivalent of $5 million in today's money. It seemed that the poker game was fixed by the wonderfully named fellow gambler Titanic Thompson. It was unclear who fired the fatal bullet, even though Rothstein didn't die immediately. In true gangster fashion, he refused to tell the police who'd done it, saying, You stick to your trade, I'll stick to mine. And me mother did it. Calling the shots on the White Sox side, it was Chick Gandal, as he was the player that was initially approached by Sullivan. The offer was a sum total of $100,000 to split among those that would help him throw the series. It's reported that Gandal took down $35,000 for his efforts. Scrooge Comiskey was paying him $4,000 a year. On September 21st, the players that were interested in the fix, or at least wanted to hear more, met in Chick Gandal's room, and the ball started to slowly roll. The plan got more momentum when General Do-Gooder, starting pitcher Red Faber, had to bow out of the series due to an illness. He would have started multiple games during the series, but with him out, the Black Sox would be able to get two additional starts out of their co-conspirators, Lefty Williams 
and Eddie Chikati. Enough were reportedly convinced and the plan to throw the series moved forward. They indicated that the fix was in with the predetermined signal of Chikati, who started game one, hitting Cincinnati leadoff hitter Maury Rath in the back. When asked to comment on this, Rath responded, what, you couldn't just like tug your left earlobe or something? Chikati further reinforced his dedication to throwing the series when he threw a ball over his second baseman's head on a potential double play ball a little later that game. The series was the best of nine and the evidence seems to pile up. Lefty Williams, one of the Black Sox, lost three games in the series, which is a record. The fix was not without its bumps. Each of the Black Sox were supposed to be paid on a loss-by-loss -loss basis. Around Game 4, the gamblers went back on this deal, claiming that the money that was owed to the Black Sox was now in the hands of the bookies, as it was let out on bets. This understandably angered the Black Sox, and they won Games 6 and 7 in an attempted double-cross. Well, it was now the gamblers' turn to be upset, as they began threatening the family members of the Black Sox, but in the end, all was smoothed over when Lefty Williams started Game 8, and the Sox lost the series. The players involved in throwing the series were paid a minimum of $5,000, while Chick Gandle took the aforementioned $35,000. Actually, that's not quite accurate. This poor bastard in Buck Weaver received all of the punishment and none of the benefit, as he was flagged as one of the Black Sox, but managed to make a grand total of zero dollars off the scandal. He didn't make any money because he was reportedly playing his heart out, batting 324 and racking up 11 hits during the series. Despite not participating in the fix, he was still lumped in with the seven others that were punished due to knowing about the plot and not saying anything about it. If you need to imagine him as any more of a babyface, picture this. When the clean Sox came to visit the indicted Sox during their trip, it was said that handshakes were exchanged and a few even attempted to tickle Buck as he was notoriously ticklish. Here's a picture of him at the trial. Fast forward to the 1920 season. Suspicion was most definitely swirling around the Sox and it came to a head when a grand jury was assembled to investigate in September. The 1920 season was still going on at this time and the Sox had found themselves in a situation where they needed to win their three final games of the season and then hope the Cleveland Indians would lose a few. The day before those final three games were to be played, Chikati owned up to his involvement in the scandal and despite the season still very much being on the line, Comiskey suspended the seven players that were still with the club. The Sox lost two out of their last three and were bested by Cleveland by two games. The trial of the Black Sox began in 1921 as they were indicted on five counts of conspiracy to obtain money by false pretenses and or via a confidence game. Seemed pretty cut and dry as two of the accused in Shoeless Joe Jackson and Eddie Chicotti had already signed confessions and testified about them in front of a grand jury. At the same time, there was a new Illinois state's attorney in Robert E. Crow. He was just in his initial days at the beginning of this trial, and it sounds as if the previous administration had left things a bit of a mess including a great deal of the evidence associated with the Black Sox trial. The signed confessions were just gone. When confronted with this knowledge, Shoeless Joe Jackson and Eddie changed their story a little to... Yeah, no, we didn't say that. They actually pled the fifth, but it had the same effect as the lack of evidence led to the Black Sox being found not guilty. Being beloved baseball players, the jury, who I thought were supposed to be impartial in these sorts of things, celebrated the verdict with the players going as far as lifting some of them on their shoulders. The celebration was put to a stop fairly quickly by this man, which is a surprise because he does not look anything like a total buzzkill. The owners in both leagues were pretty sick of the tarnished reputation baseball received from the Black Sox scandal, among other issues, and so the first commissioner of baseball was appointed. It was the buzzkill in Kennesaw Mountain Landis. That is a name like a lead brick. Well, the mountain needed to restore some faith in baseball, so he suspended the eight Black Sox from baseball for life, which not only knocked them out of the league, but it also deprived them of accolades like the Hall of Fame. He wasn't pulling punches either. After the ban, several members of the Black Sox attempted to put together a tour of exhibition games, but the Mountain informed anyone that played with them would also be banned from baseball for life. They then attempted to schedule weekly exhibition games in Chicago, but the Chicago City Council said they'd strip the license of any stadium that hosted them. I'm actually a little nervous that YouTube is going to blackball us for including them in the tournament, but we're not gonna crumble under the pressure of Big Tube. The 1919 White Sox are the first entrance into Group B. So let's take a quick look at the roster. Starting with the eight players that were banned from baseball activities, the most notable was Shoeless Joe Jackson. Now, in his confession that mysteriously vanished, he admits to accepting $5,000, but also says he never spoke to any of the gamblers, never took part in any of the meetings, nor did he make any attempt to throw the games. He was just happy to accept the money if the team happened to lose. There might be something to this story as he hit 375 in the series, netted the only home run hit, and didn't make a single error in the field. His ban is the most hotly debated and is likely the only thing preventing him from being a no-doubter of a Hall of Famer, as he was in the top 10 in war for 8 of his 13 seasons. 
led the league in hits twice, led the league in on-base percentage in 1911 with a not-too-shabby 468. He was only 32 when he was banned, so he likely had several productive years left in the day. We've talked about the mastermind a bit in Chick Gandal. He was a defensive dynamo at first base, leading the league in fielding percentage four times. He exited the league after the 1919 season near his peak as he hit 290 that year and only struck out 20 times in over 400 plate appearances. Swede Risberg was Chick Gandal's right-hand man. The story goes that Shoeless Joe was angry that his money was being held back, so he threatened to expose the whole scheme. Risberg threatened Joe's life and must have been convincing as Joe Jackson fell in line afterwards. As a player, there's not much to talk about. He was banned at the age of 25 and only had four years under his belt. It's said that he was maddeningly inconsistent. A stud one day, a dud the next. Or maybe he just threw more games than we know about. Next, we have poor Buck Weaver, who seems to have all of the deniability of Shoeless Joe Jackson and none of the money. Consensus is that he knew about the fix, but didn't participate in it. He even made some of the more intelligent recommendations, like getting the money up front from the gamblers as to avoid the aforementioned threats to people's well-being. But he was banned just the same. Nice guys everywhere raising their hands and saying, I'm familiar with that feeling. He hit 324 in the series, which was pretty good for him, as he typically topped out at about 270-ish for his career. Center fielder Happy Felsch was in on it, and maybe he should have pumped the brakes a little bit on throwing the series. He hit a dazzling 192 in the series, and despite being one of the best center fielders in the league, he misplayed balls during crucial moments. He might have the best summary quote in this whole ordeal with this timely statement. Well, the beans are spilled and I think I'm through with baseball. I got $5,000. I could have got just about that much by being on the level if the Sox had won the series. And now I'm out of baseball, the only profession I know anything about, and a lot of gamblers have gotten rich. The joke seems to be on us. Fred McMullen didn't play much, but he overheard players talking about the fix and threatened to turn them in, which was good. Unfortunately, that's not the end of his story. He threatened to turn them in if they didn't include him in the fix. A bold strategy for someone that only saw two at-bats during the eight-game series. Still, his role in the fix may have been extremely significant. In addition to being a utility man, he also served as the team's advanced scout, so could have played a role in damaging even the Clean Sox's performance in the series by feeding them false information. We talked about Eddie Ciccotti a little already, so I won't say much except that he was considered a premier pitcher at the time of his ban, relying on his knuckleball to get guys out. In 1917, his ERA of 153 was enough to lead the league. Lastly, Lefty Williams is one of two pitchers that lost three games in the World Series, as he did so by posting an ERA of 663. Now, the three losses were a little less remarkable, as they were playing a best of nine back then, but the performance was in stark contrast for a pitcher with a career ERA of 3.13 and three seasons in the top 10 for strikeouts. I'll also note that a member of the St. Louis Browns and Joe Gettian was banned for life for betting on the series after learning about the fix. In what we call a dick move today, he actually tried to double dip. Once the series was over, he attempted to collect a reward by reporting the fix to Mr. Kamiski. That reminds me of the time I stole my neighbor's car, blew it up, returned the steering wheel, and asked him for 20 bucks. They weren't all black socks. Eddie Collins seems to be considered the leader of what would come to be called the clean socks, and he must have had a pretty convincing alibi as he only hit 226 during the series. If it wasn't for the specter of a lifetime ban, he may have considered, yep, was totally throwing. That poor performance was an outlier, however, as he ranked number 24 in the Sporting News' list of the 100 greatest baseball players. And if you're going with Bill James's metric of win shares, he's the greatest second baseman of all time. He's a member of the 3000 Hit Club, but holds the lowest home run total of any member. He made his money with his feet, not in a, not in a weird way, should have went with legs there, Anyhow, he led the league in stolen bases in four different seasons and has the 13th highest war of all time. Ray Schock was a Hall of Fame catcher who pretty much started every game and was considered the best defensive catcher of his era. It's said that gamblers didn't even bother approaching him, such was his reputation for being honorable. Catchers of the time were generally large and slow. Schock bucked that trend and showed the league all the ways a catcher could contribute defensively as he was one of the first catchers to get involved in other infield plays like backing up first base on throws. And I'm now realizing Ray Schalk is also coming off the bench for the six out of fives. I, uh, 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 let's just hope they don't get into the same game. My motherboard has fried too many times already. 
Eddie Murphy played the role as narc in this whole scandal as Swede Risberg and Chick Gandel attempted one of the weakest lies ever told. The pool of money being amassed in the clubhouse wasn't for the player's own benefit. No, it was a reward for the Tigers and congratulations for beating them in the series. When asked about the truth of this statement during the trial, Murphy denied it in the same way that I rejected the lie from my son that the Grinch was the one that knocked all the ornaments off the tree. The last of the offensive starters is Nemo Leibold. On one hand, the vindication is great, but I feel sorry for the guys that were terrible during the season, and yet the judge believed that they weren't involved in the scandal because, nope, they were just that bad. Leibold was one such person, going a stellar 1 for 18 at the plate. Swinging over to the pieces of the starting rotation we haven't touched yet, Dickie Kerr won both of his games that he pitched during the series. Mr. Comiskey rewarded him for his loyalty and his stellar performance by not giving him a raise, causing him to hold out of his contract in 1922. In his absence from the team, he participated in exhibition games for other squads, and it wasn't the Sox, so it didn't result in a lifetime ban, but it did result in a suspension causing him to miss two years in the majors. John Sullivan played his one and only season for the White Sox in 1919. He was a dominant pitcher, but got dizzy every time he had to bend over and fill the ball, so he was a terrible fielder. This led to him only starting four games for the Sox and didn't appear in the World Series that year. Comiskey tried to send him to the minors. He said, nah, and was never heard from again. Lastly, we have Frank Schellenbach, who only pitched half the season with the Sox, and he was on top of the world in 1918 with a 266 ERA. Then the league decided to outlaw the spitball, which apparently his career relied heavily heavily upon, as his 1919 season was considerably worse and would be his final year in the majors. This rule ban also had a large part in torpedoing the career of the most notable members of the bullpen in Dave Danforth and Red Faber, who are joined by Joe Benz, Roy Wilkinson, and Tom McGuire. So it's going to be a second chance for these socks. Now that the need for money has been digitally erased from their brains, how are they going to stack up against these other teams in the Doug's Experimental Baseball Tournament? Tomorrow we'll be back learning about who will be the immediate challengers of the Black Sox as we take a look at the second team in Group B, so come on back for that. Once again, the, if you've enjoyed these videos, the most helpful thing you could do for the Dugs is to like them and subscribe to our channel, as that's the most surefire way that the Dugs becomes a thing. And as always, I've been Johnny Paprika, hoping all your balls are fair and all of your wood is good. Good night, everybody!